He is finishing his dissertation and doctoral degree from uh, the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And that's pretty awesome if you ask me. He holds degrees in Near Eastern Studies and a master's degree in Biblical Theology from Marquette University and his research is on the Royal Psalms and the Dead Sea Scrolls. He currently uh, lives in Springville and he's teaching part-time at BYU, is that right? And he's a uh, quite a scholar, a developing uh, young scholar and has a nice web page called uh, Celestial Ascent. Heavenly Ascent, Heavenly Ascent. I, I check it out regularly, it's uh, got some interesting stuff. So he will be speaking on From Dust to the Exalted Crown, Royal and Temple Themes, Common to the Psalms and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Thank you, Bill, I appreciate that introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here, especially because we're doing this in, in memory of Matthew Brown. Uh, early on in uh, my education, I was very much inspired by Matt Brown's uh, The Gate of Heaven in subsequent books, and uh, I was looking forward to learning more from him. Uh, but I'm, I'm very happy that we can be here today and, and to dedicate all this great research uh, to his memory. For those who are looking, discussion of the temple and temple-related imagery can be found abundantly among the scrolls discovered in the caves of Qumran. We find a strong focus on the priesthood, and there is talk of a purified temple, including the glorious eschatological temple that the community expected would come in the end times, and talk of temple worship. There are texts that draw on the Ark of the Covenant narratives uh, that mention the Holy of Holies and that tell of measuring lines and plummets. If we consider the Garden of Eden story to be a temple text, there are a number of scrolls that make references to the garden setting and to the figure of Adam and also Eve. And it has become well known that the community at Qumran sought to regain all the glory of Adam. That is, they desired to be clothed in God's glory, as Adam was in the Garden of Eden. The Qumran community believed that they had access to the true temple, which was equated with Eden. As our time is limited here, a broad discussion of temple imagery in the Dead Sea Scrolls, fun as it might sound, uh, will not be possible. What this presentation will focus on is a small selection of temple-related themes found in some of the Qumran documents and how the authors of these documents drew on royal psalms known from the biblical Psalter to express these themes. The royal psalms, including Psalms 2, 18, 89, 10, 132, and others, are thus designated due to their content, which includes mentions of the Israelite monarchy uh, and or expressions and settings that would have involved the Israelite king. Many of these psalms uh, are psalms that Christians would consider messia <coughs> messianic. In my PhD research, I have found that many of the, po uh, the poetical writings found at Qumran, including the Hodayot, or Thanksgiving Psalms, and the many non-canonical Psalms found rely heavily on the Royal Psalms for inspiration, uh, especially I've concluded on Psalms 18 and 89. The content in the Qumran writings that is based on these Royal Psalms relates to, among other things, the exaltation of the speaker of the Psalm and or his community their participation in the divine council, including communion with angels uh, and visions of deity, uh, God instructing the leader of the community in the heavenly mysteries, which include uh, God's primeval victories and the creation of the world, and also appointing the leader as a teacher of those mysteries. The revelation of the mysteries or wonders of God evokes in some texts a reaction of praise, shouting, or singing, and sometimes is also connected to the imagery of being clothed 
in glorious or priestly robes. I'll begin with the idea of the exaltation of mortal beings in the scrolls. Of course, I'm just, just going to skim the surface. There's so much in the scrolls uh, that, that deals with this. Um, so uh, this is often expressed in terms of the lifting up of the leader and or group from dust to the eternal heights. As British scholar Crispin Fletcher Louis has pointed out, uh, commenting on the corpus of poetical writings known as the Thanksgiving Psalms, or in Hebrew, the Hodayot, much of the Hodayot is a sustained and extended uh, meditation on the anthropology, anthropology of Genesis 2-7, where Adam is formed from the dust of the ground. He explains that after Adam and Eve are created from the lowly dust of the ground, uh, according to some texts, they are subsequently placed in Eden. They are elevated to a new glorious state. Uh, and Fletcher Louis asserts that the movement of Adam and Eve into Eden becomes a paradigm for entry and full inclusion of the Israelite in the temple and in the holiness that it gives God's people. The way that we find this motif uh, expressed in the Hodayot is often in the speaker of the hymn, uh, who is depicted as a suffering servant of God, crying out to the Lord from the depths of the underworld or from the grasp of death and asking for deliverance. The speaker then praises God for, uh, for having saved him uh, and raised him up to the eternal heights, to the heavenly realm where he may now mingle with the gods. For example, in 4Q Hodayot A, fragment seven, lines eight and nine. Um, oh, I think we're on the right place. Um, we read, uh, God lifts up the poor from the dust to the eternal height, and to the clouds he magnifies him in stature. And he is with the heavenly beings in the assembly of the community. Similarly, similarly in column 11 of 1Q Hodayot A, lines 20 to 24, we read, I give thanks to you, O Lord, for you have redeemed my soul from the pit, from Sheol and from Abaddon. You have raised me up to an eternal height so that I may walk about on a limitless plain. I know that there is hope for him who have you, whom you have formed from the dust for the eternal counsel, that he might take his place with the host of the holy ones and enter into community with the congregation of the children of heaven. In the Royal Psalms, similar imagery is applied to the figure of the king. In Psalm two, the king has been placed by God on Mount Zion. God's holy hill. In Psalm 110, the royal figure is given a seat at God's right hand. The language that we see in some of these psalms from the Hodayot, however, is alluding directly to Psalm 18. In Psalm 18, the psalmist cries out to the Lord for, the, for deliverance from the cords of Sheol and from the snares of death. The Lord hears his servant's voice and comes flying out of his temple in fiery indignation to free the suffering servant from his enemies. He reaches down from on high and draws his servant up out of the mighty waters and lifts him up into a safe place, exalting him above his adversaries. Okay, and that's all in Psalm 18. The idea of being raised from death or from the dust to an exalted state is not uncommon in biblical texts. In 1 Samuel 2.8, which some scholars recognize as a royal psalm, it says, God raises up the poor from the dust to make them sit with princes and inherit a throne of glory. The election of a ruler from among the common people is repeatedly referred to as raising one from the dust, a formula clearly stated in the words of the Lord to King Basha 
of Israel in 1 Kings 16.2. I exalt you out of the dust, and I exalted you out of the dust and made you a leader over my people Israel. Walter Brueggemann, in his study From Dust to Kingship, argues, to be taken from the dust means to be elevated from obscurity to royal office. Since the royal office depends on, upon covenant with the appropriate God, to be taken from the dust means to be accepted as a covenant partner. In the Qumran text, therefore, we see the speaker of the hymns, uh, who is likely the leader of the congregation, placing himself in the position of the king from the royal psalms. In support of Brueggemann's theory, we find a text uh, called 1QSB, or the Rule of the Blessing. Uh, there's a figure known as the Prince of the Congregation, who is, taken, who is to take part in a great renewal of the covenant and who is blessed to be lifted up to an eternal height. The Hodayot equate the eternal heights with the divine council, the congregation of the holy ones. As cited above, lines 21 to 24 of 1Q Hodayot A, column 11, indicate that when the speaker is exalted, he is permitted to enter the eternal council and join the congregation of the children of heaven. In a number of texts, the exaltation of the servant to the divine council is followed by God teaching him the covenant in, conjun in conjunction with the divine mysteries. In 1Q Hodayot A, column uh, 15, the servant proclaims, You have exalted my horn on high, and I shine forth with sevenfold light. I thank you, O Lord, that you have instructed me in your truth and made known to me your wondrous mysteries. In column 12, we see a similar reference. You have made my face to shine by your covenant. I seek you as an enduring dawning, as perfect light. You have revealed yourself to me. Okay, this is the, the speaker talking to God. For you have given me understanding of the mysteries of your wonder. In a number of texts, it is apparent that the knowledge that the servant learns from God in the divine council, the so-called mysteries of wonder, is related to God's great primeval victories, including the crushing of the dragon Rahab, the calming of the waters of chaos, and the establishment of the earth upon the seas. In essence, the servant is taught in the congregation of heaven about God's work in the creation of the universe. I have found this sequence to be a pattern that can be found throughout the corpus of the Hodayot and in other non-canonical psalms found at Qumran, including 4Q381, which has been labeled by scholars as a collection of previously unknown royal psalms. My research has led me to believe that this pattern is based on either directly or indirectly, the traditions found in Psalm 89. In Psalm 89, we have God making his covenant with his chosen servant, David. In verses 3 and 4, um, well, and that happens in verses 3 and 4. Uh, we are then transported in verse 5, uh, to the congregation of the holy ones, where the psalmist witnesses the heavens praising God for his wonders. In the next verses, uh, God is praised for his greatness and superiority, and then we get a description of the wonders. God stilled the raging sea. He broke Rahab in pieces and scattered all his enemies. And in verses 11 and 12, we are told about God's creation of the world. Okay. So this is taking place, uh, according to the psalm, in the heavens, that, that this is being revealed. 
In the biblical psalm, the segments regarding the election of the king and God's covenant with him, the praising of God and the divine counsel, and then the events that follow seem to be disjointed. It is difficult to see how they are related. However, in the Qumran compositions that draw on this psalm, these elements are used more seamlessly uh, to, pre to present us with a fuller image of what the author envisions um, for this heavenly ascent, if, if that's what we may call it. Uh, but the basic elements are all there in Psalm 89. In examples um, such as columns uh, 12 and 15 of 1Q Horayot A, the text indicates that the individual who is lifted up to heaven and taught the mysteries of creation by God is then appointed to teach others. You, my God, have appointed me as holy counsel to the weary. You have strengthened me in your covenant, and my tongue has become like the tongues of those taught by you. Through me, you have illumined the faces of many. This is the type of language that's used. The exalted individual learns in a covenant-making setting and then apparently transmits that knowledge in a covenant-making setting as well. In 1QH uh, column 12, the speaker declares that the Lord has illumined his face for your covenant. Strikingly, this illumination apparently occurs in a situation in which the Lord has appeared, in line 7, to the speaker. Later in the text, the speaker alludes to a group of people that follow him. He proclaims to the Lord that they have gathered together for your covenant, and that he has examined them, in line 25. He then relates, those who walk in the way of your heart, listen to me. They are drawing themselves up before you in the council of the holy ones. The outcome of the teacher passing on the mysteries that he has learned in heaven to his followers is that they, as a group, are then able to draw themselves up into the presence of God in the divine council. As Samuel Thomas explains in his monograph on the mysteries of Qumran, uh, the members of the mortal community, through their worship service, take part in a kind of imagined temple setting in which the human participants meet the angelic retinue in a mutually transformational worship experience. As I indicated previously, there are elements in these texts that indicate that a vision of the deity is the centerpiece of this celestial learning experience. Elliot Wolfson argues that a number of these texts um, contain, or they describe knowledge of, of divine truth, um, and it's equated with visually gazing at the glory, which occasions the recitation of God's mysteries. In other words, the revelation of the mysteries occurs in, con in conjunction with a vision of God's glory. Similar imagery can be found in Psalm 63, 2, where the psalmist says, Thus I have gazed on you in the sanctuary, seeing your power and your glory. This leads us back to Psalm 89, where after the description or revelation of God's wonders, we now see a group of people in verse 15 uh, which we should understand to be the mortal congregation that are participating and perhaps reacting here. This verse should probably be translated as it is in the RSV, um, NRSV, ESV, and others as, happy are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. I suggest that an appropriate interpretation of this line in light of the Qumran texts is that the people are the followers of the individual who has been exalted. As we see in verse 17, um, that they have now been exalted to the heavenly courts as well. And that the festal shout that they know to give is the appropriate reaction to the revelation of God's mysteries uh, presented in the preceding verses. 
This is evidently how the authors of our Qumran text um, understood this sequence. An apocryphal psalm known as the Hymn to the Creator, uh, found on the Great Psalm Scroll 11Q PSA, draws on Psalm 89. The hymn praises Yahweh for his wondrous deeds uh, during the creation in, uh, in much the same way as we find in Psalm 89. After making a clear allusion to the qualities of God's face and his throne as described in Psalm 89, 14, the hymn goes on to describe how the angels reacted when they were shown God's wonders uh, in the creation of the world. The text says, when all his angels saw they sang for joy, for he had shown them what they knew not. The imagery of the heavenly beings witnessing the creation and rejoicing in song is found in Job 38.7, where the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. I believe that the author of the hymn to the creator, after clearly alluding to Psalm 89.14, meant to equate the motif of the angels singing for joy with verse 15, where the human congregation who are walking in the light of God's face know the festal shout and in verse 16, rejoice in God's name all day long. This juxtapositioning of angels and mortals is common in the text of the Judean desert. The hymnist's impetus for making the connection may have been his familiar, familiarity with the temple ritual and the tradition of equating the priesthood with angels in his community. A temple ritual that appears to be related to these motifs is recorded in Sirach 50. The account tells of the high priest, Simon Benonius, and how he repaired the temple, laying the foundations for the temple walls and building them up. As part of the ritual, Simon emerges from the temple as the embodiment of God's glory and completes the sacrifices. After he pours the wine offering on the altar, the account relates that then the sons of Aaron shouted. They blew their trumpets of hammered metal. They sounded a mighty fanfare as a reminder before the Most High. This part of the ritual recalls, recalls the feast of the uh, Yom Teruah, um, the day of shouting or the day of trumpet blasts, mandated in Leviticus 23-24 and Numbers 29-1. A fragmentary text from 4Q381, uh, fragment 15, depicts an image very similar to the overall setting we have been describing. In this text, the Lord's servant praises the Lord for the wonders of creation, following the pattern of Psalm 89 and then relates that he understands this knowledge because God has instructed him. There are some gaps in the scroll in the next lines, but we then see the voice becoming plural, just as it does in Psalm 89. The group sings, For we will call on your name, my God, and for, for your salvation, paralleling uh, the festal shout and rejoicing. And then in the next line, after a few missing words, the text says, And like a robe, they will put it on and a covering. And, and we don't get anything else after that. Um, so we don't know exactly what was being put on. The reference in line nine to salvation in proximity to the clothing language is reminiscent of Isaiah 61.10. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Jubilees 1630 indicates that uh, the Israelites as part of the ritual of, of the pilgrim feast of tabernacles set a wreath or a crown on their heads. This festal, festal investiture imagery can be found in later Jewish and Christian writings concerning the last days. For example, in 4th Esdras 2, 38-46, Ezra describes those participating in the eschatological feast. Those who have departed from the shadow of this age have received glorious garments from the Lord. 
Take again your full number, O Zion, and close the list of your people who are clothed in white, who have fulfilled the law of the Lord. Ezra then sees the Son of God placing crowns on these individuals, and he asks his uh, angelic guide about them. Then I asked the angel, Who are these, my Lord? He answered and he said to me, These are they who have put off mortal clothing and have put on the immortal and have confessed the name of God. Now they are being crowned and receive palms. Okay. Um, I'm about out of time here, I believe. Um, so I'm going to summarize uh, a bit here. I believe that this is all coming from the ancient traditions regarding kings. We read that, um, that King David often put on uh, priestly vestments um, as he led uh, the Ark of the Covenant um, up, to, up to Jerusalem. He wore fine linen robes and a, and a linen ephod. Okay? Um, Brother Perry explained to us very well what those, what those vestments are. And, and we see those uh, being used by the king. Um, so I, I, I see in here these um, hymns from Qumran drawing on the royal psalms and even bringing in the idea of, of the vestments that were used um, by the royal figures. Um, to close, I would bring up the, uh, the songs of the sag- Sabbath sacrifice. Um, which are some really interesting hymns that were discovered and that have been described by by different scholars as a conductor's score for a ritualized ascent to heaven where the human participants, the community's priesthood, engage in a weekly ritual, a cultic drama of, of ascending up into heaven, of appearing before God, and in the end, in the last... Um, psalm they are arguably these human uh, participants that have been raised to heaven they are vested in in priestly or more specifically in angelic um, clothing and then are given um, the authority to go and and teach uh, these things to their people um, and I wish I had to, I had more time to touch on that um, but in summary then Sorry about that. Uh, in summary, um, what we're seeing, this pattern that, that I've seen through these Qumran texts, thanks, um, we see an individual, likely the leader of the community or the congregation, is delivered by God and lifted up to stand in the divine council. In this heavenly setting, the exalted man is taught the mysteries of wonder, which include the story of God's primeval victories and his creation of the world. This instruction is apparently given by God himself, uh, and some texts state that the individual has gazed upon God, uh, or God's glory, or that God has appeared to him. The individual is appointed to teach the mysteries to his community, Uh, And those who receive his teachings are likewise elevated to heaven uh, and participate in the heavenly vision and praise God with the angelic beings. When the group, uh, probably both mortals and angels, witness the, uh, the revelation of the wonderful deeds of God in the creation, they shout or sing for joy and engage in praising God. Um, and they are also, in some texts, clothed in heavenly robes of righteousness. Uh, again, this, this is to be found all over uh, in these poetical texts of, of Qumran, and this is barely scratching the surface, and I think there's a lot of, of great re- research that can still be done on this. Thank you very much.